the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Indian Trail. Good morning, church. Merry Christmas. Won't you stand with us? Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy my God and sins reconciled
all can be seated. There's faith in the path, mercy on the mountain, grace every step in between. There's all I hold dear, we're lost in the fire, I'm trusting in things unseen, things you let go, things you're withholding, things that you know. Father, you know me When the mountains sing your praise And the valleys near your reign In constant hell through change God, you are the same. You're great either way. Oh, 
And not too certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Now to the Lord sing praises all you within this place and with true love and brotherhood each other now embrace this holy tide of Christmas all love done to face all oh, tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy all oh, tidings of comfort and Joy. Oh, help us out. Get your hands going again. Just like that. Uh, have you ever had just one of those crazy weeks? I, I kind of had a little crazy event or two during the week. I, I lost my wallet the other day, and uh, I couldn't find that thing anywhere. I, I, I was getting ready to leave, and uh, I, I knew I, I, I my driver's license was there, my money was there, credit cards, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, and, and I turned the house upside down looking for that thing, you know. My son lost a set of keys. Couldn't find those keys uh, anywhere he looked. Um, a friend of mine um, lost their joy. I, I, I talked to him a long time. Another friend of mine this week lost his job. Another lost their health. It was just a, really a week of uh, losing stuff. You ever had those kind of weeks? Um, we... Uh, been here for 40 years now, 40 and a half years. This is my 41st uh, Christmas sermon. You know, 41. I, I, I didn't, didn't say that for that, but I appreciate that more than you, more than you know. Uh, but we've looked at Christmas. And by the way, if you, if you add the 41 Christmas sermons, and normally I would preach two or three just like I'm doing this time, I will preach three Christmas sermons during the season. So in all probability, I've, I've preached over a hundred sermons about Christmas in the time that I've been here. We've looked at Christmas from every angle that you possibly could look at. We looked at it from the angle of the angels, the, the angle of Mary, the angle of Joseph, the wise men, the shepherds, the innkeeper, you name it. And we've talked about, I, I remember one season, uh, I preached uh, on just the gifts of Christmas. 
Uh, we've looked at it from every angle that I, I guess you could imagine. Uh, this year, I've entitled the message, What is the Reason for the Season? You may have seen some post on my social media in the last few days. And, and in order to get to the reason for the season, you can't stay in Bethlehem. You, you can't just visualize Christmas as a baby in a manger. You've got to get way into the future of the Lord Jesus if you're really going to see the reason for the season. You have to look at Jesus as an adult. It is there that he explains the why that he came. My text today, in case you brought a copy of the word of God or have it on one of your appliances, is in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10 Really, the reason for the season is in a nutshell right here uh, in this passage. For the Son of Man is come to seek, all right? For the Son of Man, Jesus, came, there's the reason for the season, okay? To seek and to save that which was lost. That sums up the entire reason that Jesus came to this earth. Uh, he came to live, to grow up, to die, to be buried, to resurrect from the dead. Now, if you don't understand this, then all this other stuff about Christmas doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Then why do we celebrate? You know, what's the purpose? What's the reason for the celebration? If you don't understand why he came, doesn't make any sense to put up a Christmas tree. Doesn't make any sense to buy all of these presents. Doesn't make any sense to have all of these gatherings on December the 25th. If you don't understand why that Jesus came to this earth, he came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. Now, what does that mean? What's it mean to be lost? What does it mean to be found? What does it mean to be saved? Well, the answer really is found in the lost and found chapter of the Bible. If I were to ask you to name me, what's the lost and found chapter of the Bible? Could you do it? It's found in Luke chapter 15. It's really three stories that are wrapped up in the lost and found chapter. That's what it's called. It's the story about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. You all know those stories frontwards and backwards. Uh, a shepherd had a hundred sheep. He took care of them all day long, watched after them, made sure they had plenty of food, made sure they had plenty of water, let them graze all day long. And then at nighttime, he brings them up to the sheep pen. And the good shepherd then, he counts them as they're going in. There's 10, there's 19, there's 26, there's 44, there's 85, there's 92, 93, 98, 99, and all of a sudden he realizes, I've lost one. There's only 99 out of the 100. What in the world could have happened? So he secures the sheep in the sheep pen and he sets out to go find the one lost sheep. And he searches, he looks, he discovers, finds the lost sheep, brings him back in. And the Bible says that the shepherd celebrated. He threw a party. He was extremely glad. And then there was the story of a woman who lost a coin. Uh, she searched and searched and searched. Now she had other coins, but this was one coin that meant a lot. It had great value to her. And, and she looked everywhere for that coin and she finally found the coin. And the Bible says she celebrated. She threw a party. And then there's the story of the lost son. 
the younger of two went to his daddy and he said, now daddy, I know that you're not dead yet. And uh, I want my half of the inheritance now. I, I don't want to wait. Uh, I want it now. And uh, when you give it to me, I, I want you to know that I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm done. And I, I want what's coming to me now. So he gets half of his inheritance and he leaves his family. And the Bible says that he spends it all on riotous living, loose living. And, and if you really look at the context, it's primarily he spent it all on adultery and illicit sex. He winds up feeding hogs. You have to understand Jewish people, that's as far away as you can possibly get. And he's looking at the slop. And I know what that's like. I, I used to do that. We would go to the YMCA camp and the YWCA camp and we would load up in 55 gallon drums and we would bring that slop back to our house and I would feed, the, and I'd get it all over me. Nasty. I, I really can smell that aroma right now. I can tell you this. Not one time did I ever want to eat that. <laughs> but this old boy got as far away from God and far away from his upbringing that he was tempted to eat the slop. And finally, he says, you know what? I know my dad probably is not going to restore me back to where I was, but... but the fact of the matter is my daddy's servants have got it a lot better. So I'll just go to dad and I'll say, dad, just, you know, um, I don't want my bedroom back. J just let me be one of your servants. So he makes his way back home and his daddy's been looking for him. And daddy doesn't wait until he gets up to the house. He runs to meet him and embraces him. And he puts a ring on his finger and a robe and sandals and the Bible says that they threw a party. They had a spell. The common denominator in all of those three stories is they threw a party. It was a huge celebration because something that was lost was found. May, may I say to any of you that may be in this room or may be watching my live stream today that it really doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've drifted. It doesn't matter how lost you are. God loves you so very much that he came to seek you out so he could change your life. Now, when you're disconnected from God, and by the way, if you've never been saved, you're disconnected from God. Your sin has separated you from God. And when you're disconnected from God, maybe you've experienced something like this, that something happens and you want to pray, but it doesn't seem like that your prayers can ever get above the ceiling and that God is millions of miles away. But that's not true. He's right. I heard Bailey Smith say that the first prayer that God ever answers for anybody is the prayer of repentance. And he's close. Right to you this morning that he's willing to forgive you no matter how far you've gone and restore you. Now, I opened up this morning by saying this stuff about lostness, by lost my keys, my son, um, I lost my billfold, my son lost his keys. We had all kinds of examples of lostness. I want to tell you this morning what you've lost when you're disconnected from God. Number one, you've lost your bearings. You've lost your bearings. You just wander around. You're like that sheep that we talked about a few minutes ago of the hundred sheep, this one sheep lost his bearings and he began to wander. And he didn't realize that he was wandering. He was just naturally following his instincts. 
and going wherever he wanted to go. It was his nature to wander. He'd see a little bit of grass over here that was greener than where he was, and so I'll just eat that. And he'd see a little more green grass over here, and he would just eat of that. And before you know it, he had drifted so far away, he had lost sight of the rest of the herd. He didn't intend to get lost. Really wasn't his purpose. Uh, that stands true with human beings as well. We're just prone to wonder. We do it naturally. We don't follow God's ways from a natural perspective. And it's natural for us to have it our own way and to go in our own direction and, and to seek our own way out and do what we want to do. That is just who we are. I'll never forget when I was just a, just a tot over uh, in the mountains. Matter of fact, I saw a picture of a dear friend of mine and his family. They were at Devil's Courthouse. You ever heard of Devil's Courthouse? I got lost and just the name itself scared me to death. But I got lost in Devil's Courthouse. I didn't mean to. I was just curious. Had my cousin with me and and we just wanted to explore. And so we got out over into the hillsides and the mountains and just kept walking, thinking, well, we could get back. But before we knew it, we were lost. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's just who we are. And, and, and can I say something to you this morning? You're going to stay lost as long as you seek to have it your own way. You're going to stay lost when your bearings are all messed up. Number two, not only are your bearings messed up, your bodyguard is missing. Your bodyguard is missing. Do you know that sheep are probably the most vulnerable animal that God ever created? They don't have sharp teeth to bite anything. They can't run very fast. They don't have any claws on their hoofs. They're vulnerable to the attack of every predator in, because they absolutely can't defend themselves. And so they get over there and they wander off and they get lost and they have no natural means of defense. The shepherd is nowhere around to take care of them. And so they wind up getting overcome by the predator that takes their life and they die. May, may I just really encourage you? When you're living your life as though life depends solely on you, you don't have a bodyguard. You don't have a shepherd. You don't have a hedge of protection around your life to keep you safe. And no wonder when you're depending on life as it depends on you yourself, it's no wonder you get worried and tired and stressed out and depressed and all of those other things that go along with it because you don't have any protection around to keep it from happening. You're on your own. You don't have a shepherd. I love the psalmist. The Lord is my, what? The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus called himself the good Shepherd, And when you're out there on your own and you're chasing life on your own terms and you're wandering away, your bodyguard is missing. Number three, your bounty is minimized. Your bounty is minimized. It's the story of the lost coin. Um, I brought with me today a, a silver dollar. Um, I've had that silver dollar several decades. The reason I keep it, it's my, it was, it was uh, printed, stamped uh, on my daddy's uh, birthday. And I just kind of keep it. Now, there's no telling how many thousands of hands that this silver dollar has passed through. This silver dollar has the potential of feeding the poor, starting a new business, this silver dollar has the potential of doing a lot of good stuff. It could even provide some entertainment and pleasure for you. It has that kind of potential. But guess what? If it's lost, it loses its potential. It keeps its worth 
It's still worth the same thing, but it's lost its potential to do what it could have done. Still a silver dollar. First Corinthians 9, uh, 2, 9 says, but as it is written, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of any of us what God has in store for us. Talking about our potential. We really don't have a clue what God could do in and through our lives. And if you're not connected to God, if you've not been saved, if you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you're missing out on everything that God designed for you in this life. And the Bible says you can't imagine You can't dream it up. You have no clue what God really wants to do in and through your life if you're not plugged in. You know what? You're kind of worthless. Now, I'm a big dreamer. I really, I've always been that big dreamer. I'm a visionary. You you wouldn't believe some of the, I'm I'm 74 years old. You wouldn't believe some of the dreams that I am having right now of what I believe that God wants to do in and through my life and through the ministry of this church. I'm a big dreamer. I I can big dream, dream big dreams. But God says, "Hmm." doesn't even compare to what I got for you, you know? Number four, your bliss is substituted for misery. Your bliss is substituted. If you're not really plugged into God, if you're not in unity with God, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, then you're in conflict with God. Think with me for a minute about the lost son. Um, He hits rock bottom. And and in that chapter in Luke 15 in verse 14, the Bible says, and when he had spent everything, when he had spent it all, he began to be in want. Ladies and gentlemen, you can have all of the money in the world, but when you have conflict with God, you're really miserable in this life. When you have conflict at home, when you have conflict with your wife, when you have conflict with your kids, when you go to work on Monday morning and you're in conflict with the boss and the other employees that are around you, you're miserable. Life just stinks. Not only is that true with people, it is also true with God. I want to help you with this statement. You were never born to be distanced from God. Can I say that again? You were never born to be distant from God and separated from him. Some of you, you, you've been saved, but the fact of the matter is it's been a long time since you've been close to God. Been a long time since you had that intimacy with God. Can, can I just say, guess what? He didn't move. Um, some of you have never had that connection. May I encourage you here with every ounce of energy that I have He's here right now, and he wants you to know him. Number five, Beulah land is never moved to. If you're disconnected from God, if you're separated from God, Beulah land, which means heaven, is never in your future. Um, There are not going to be any rebels when we get to heaven. Now, he'll let you rebel down here. But there are no rebels in heaven. Uh, He'll let me, while I'm down here, he'll let me take half of my inheritance. He'll let me go blow it on whatever I want to blow it on. And he'll let me, while I'm here, ignore how much that he loves me. But he's never going to allow that in heaven. There are no rebels in heaven. And you're not going to ignore God when you get there. If you get there. Now, here's the deal. What we're doing right now is we're preparing for eternity. What you're doing right now is you're preparing for 
eternity. You're preparing or ought to be preparing for Beulah land. It's really the most important thing that we'll ever do in this life is prepare for heaven. Now, some of you may get 80 years down here, but that's nothing compared to the amount of time that we're going to spend in eternity on the other side of death where we're going to live forever. And the fact of the matter is some of you are living your life right now with or in with God or you're living your life without God. And that is your choice. If you want to live, God says, without me down here on this earth, you go ahead. But you will also live without me for eternity. I uh, got a call one day from no boy and he asked me to come over to his house. And I went and, and he'd been a long-term member and his wife had already gone to be with Jesus and he asked me to come by his house and I did. And, and it was just so unlike him. It was so different than any other time I'd ever had with him. And you know, went back into a back bedroom, into a cardboard box and he dug out a bunch of stuff and threw it around. And he said, I wanted to give you something. And so he pulled out about I don't know, 25 or so gold dollars all sealed up. And he said, Pastor, I just want you to have this. I said, okay. Nobody had ever given me anything like that before. I still have every one of them right now. Do you know what? This is of no value to him right now because he's already in heaven. He's already there. This has no significance. It has no value at all. This stuff does not matter in eternity. And I want to encourage you to quit wasting your life, spending your time on things that you will never carry with you. Quit it. Jesus said, what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? But what in the world good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? We're lost because it's our nature. We're lost because of the circumstances of our life. But I've got good news for you here today. Even though you may be spiritually lost, you have not lost your value. Let me say it again because some of you are staring at me like a calf looking at a new gate. You have no clue what that means either, do you? <laughs> Two or three of my staff members hear me say stuff like that and they'll grab a pen and I'll write that down. Um, you, you may be spiritually lost, but you haven't lost your value. The sheep... One of the hundred, the, of the 99, was lost, had, had strayed off, had wandered off. But he was still valuable to the shepherd that the shepherd left the 99 because that sheep was so valuable, he left the 99 and went to find that one lost sheep. Did the coin lose its value simply because it had been brushed off the chest of drawers and had fallen down onto the floor? Did that coin lose its value simply because it couldn't be found and was not in its rightful place? No, that woman swept and swept until she finally found it because it had not lost its value. Had the son lost his value because he had taken and left, got lost in his own ambitions? Absolutely not. Daddy threw a party for him when he came home. I, I, I brought a bunch of stuff with me today. <laughs> Y'all noticed? What, what is that? Can you tell what that is? What is it? What is it? A hundred dollar bill. Now it's Christmas time. How many people in the room would like to have this $100 bill? Would you hold your hand up? Good night. All right. Okay. A thousand people want this $100 bill. How 
How many of you still want that hundred dollar bill? How many of you still want the hundred dollar bill? I can relate to everything that that hundred dollar bill went through. And there are many of you that could too. Your mamas and your daddies told you you were worthless. You would never amount to anything. You had no value whatsoever. They wished you were dead or they would have never had you to begin with. You're worthless. Or you made your own stupid mistakes. You went out and did this to yourself. You've been torn and stained and spat upon and beaten up and abused. Got news for you. You've not lost one single ounce of value to God. He loves you still the same. Whatever someone's willing to spend shows the value of what they're buying. Christmas is what God said, I am willing to give up. I'm willing to spend. I'm willing to offer for you. And if you were the only one, he would have gone through every bit of it just for you. I don't care how far you've drifted from God. I don't care where you've wound up in life at all. God still loves you and you're valuable to him and he would have died just for you. Christmas demonstrates what God was willing to pay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That first Christmas proclaimed this angel came and said, fear not, don't be afraid, for I bring you the gospel. I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people today. A savior has been born. You say, I don't need one. Well, the sheep didn't need one either. So he said, he didn't realize that he, didn't, that he needed one. But may I ask you a question? If you didn't need a savior, why in the world did God send one? Let, let me quickly share with you what it means to be saved. Number one, it means Jesus came to rescue me. First Timothy 2, 5, there's only one God and Christ Jesus is the only one who can bring us to God. Jesus was truly human. And he gave himself to all of us, to, the Bible says, to rescue us. Uh, you say, I don't need rescuing. Really? Then why can't you fix all your problems? The reason you can't fix all of your problems or haven't fixed all your problems is because you can't fix all your problems. If you could fix your problems, you would have fixed your problems. But because you haven't fixed your problems is evidence that you can't fix your problems. You need a savior. Can I get an amen right there? The psalmist says, trust me in your times of trouble and I will rescue you and you will give me glory. What do you need to be set free from today? You need to be set free like I was, to be set free from this notion that you had to please everybody all of the time. I want to tell you, friend, if that's hovering over your life, you will never, ever enjoy this life. You'll never have victory. What about bitterness and anger and anxiousness and worry? Do you need to be set free from that? Do you need to be rescued from that? We, we got a, speaking of Rick Brown and Margaret, we have a wonderful ministry called Celebrate Recovery that's pointing people all over the place, hundreds of people that are coming to realize they have 
somebody that can rescue them. Number two, he came to recover me. You think about that coin with me for just a minute? That woman lost that coin. Now, you, you, you know when you read the Bible sometimes, you, you can't help but put it in contemporary vision. And, and we've got the idea, well, it's just down here on the hardwood floor somewhere. It won't take me long. I'll find it. But no, it was a dirt floor and it was covered up with straw. And this coin somehow gets dropped and it gets in the midst of the straw. And it was like trying to find the needle in a haystack. But she kept looking and looking and searching until she found that coin. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will recover you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly and hearted. You will find rest for your souls. You will be recovered. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Kathy and I were in Colleen, Texas a number of years ago. We had a locust storm. Anybody ever been in a locust storm before? We had a man. I'm telling you, it was horrible. These huge insects came and flooded Colleen and, and, and they covered up our windows. We couldn't even see out the windows. They were so thick and they would somehow get underneath that window pane and get into our house. It was horrible for a couple of days. Now, we don't have locust storms around here, but I'm going to tell you, we had something very similar three years ago called COVID. And COVID stole a lot of things from people. So COVID stole, stole my mother. She didn't die with COVID, but she died from it. Um, some of you in the past year or so have had relationships stolen from you. You've had finances stolen from you. You've had jobs stolen uh, from you. Here's what the word of God says in Joel 2. I will give you back what you lost in the years when the locusts ate all your crops. What have the locusts stolen from you? Number three, he came to reconcile me. You know, I had this notion in my head for so many years about when I would mess up how God just reacted and he was so angry at me and so disappointed in me and he would punish me if I came back. He, he would somehow spank me if I got right with God somehow or other. I'd have to overcome his anger. To... That's a false picture of who really God is. And it, you know what? God's not out there to whip you. God's not out there angry at you. God is not mad at you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. God is just out there waiting on you to come. This reconciling, when a husband and a wife gets reconciled, Thank God the war is over. When nations get together and they reconcile their differences, there is peace in the land. When you reconcile the books, it means that the books are balanced and they're no longer out of whack. I want that you to understand that Jesus Christ came to bring peace between us and God. To reconcile us, to balance the book to bring peace and joy just to you. John Newton, have you ever heard the name John Newton? He was one of the most vile, wicked men that you could ever imagine. He was a slave trader and treated humanity horribly. God gloriously saved him. And he sat down with a pen and a piece of paper one time and he wrote the most famous hymn that has ever been penned Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was, but now I'm found. 
was blind, but now I see. Several years ago, our teenage son traveled with us to Venezuela. We get into Caracas, millions of people. Never been on a subway before in our life. We get down into the subway where it runs on those rails and we're standing there waiting on our car to arrive and we're all bunched up and there's just hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people around us and we tried to stay together. But we got on that car and I turned around and I looked at the window. The door shut. And there stood my teenage boy on the other side of that closed door. I don't know that I've ever been as frightened in my life. Now, fortunately, the missionary that we were serving with knew what to do. He came back and rescued him. But what if what if we couldn't have found him in that mob of people? What if we had to put out an APB with the police department? 24 hours goes by and we still can't find him. 48 hours goes by and we still can't find him. We're in the midst of a strange place with millions of strange people. Five days goes by. Police were driving down a street. And they saw a little movement behind a dumpster where Kevin had been hiding out for five days. They stopped. They went over to him and began to persuade him, son, we know who you are. It's okay, you're safe. We're gonna help you get to your mom and your daddy. He hadn't had any food in five days. Sleeping on the streets behind a dumpster for five days. All alone in a foreign country that he doesn't know how to speak their language. And the police are saying, now come on and go with us. And that teenage boy says, no, I don't think so. I think I'm going to just stay right here. You said, that's ridiculous. Why in the world would anybody do that? Why in the world do people go Christmas after Christmas after Christmas? Hearing the fact that God wants to reconcile you. God wants to redeem you. God wants to rescue you. And you just go, Eh, I think I'll just stay like I am. It's the dumbest mistake you'll ever make. Would you pray with me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, we believe with all of our heart that life will never make any sense whatsoever to us until we surrender to you and say yes to you. To realize that we were made by you for you. I wonder if there may be some of you that are hearing me, ready to say, you know what? I've been chasing around doing my own thing long enough. I've lost my bearings. I've wandered off. I'm lost. And I can't fix my problems. And Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. 
How many of you would be willing to say, you know what, God, um, I, I can't earn my way to you. So Lord Jesus, come right now and rescue me. If that's your desire, pray something like this with me. Heavenly Father, today I say yes to you and no to me. I realize that you love me and you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. Forgive me of all my sin. I know now that you made me for you. Come into my heart. Save my soul. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.